Welcome everyone to the RMIT Global Career Webinar on Transformation in the Aviation Sector. My name is Marta Fernandez and I'm the Executive Director at RMIT Europe, the University Hub in Barcelona. RMIT is a global university that we are proud to have been founded on the land of the Wurundjeri people of Kulin Nations, the Aboriginal traditional owners of Melbourne. And whenever we meet in Melbourne, we say welcome in the Wurundjeri language and acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and their elders past and present. So in that spirit, Womin Jeka, welcome. Today, we'll be hearing from three industry leaders in the aviation sector, and I'm very proud to say that they are all members of RMIT's global community. As we go along, please feel free to add your comments and questions in the Q&A. Give the ones you would most like to hear answered a like, and we'll try to cover as many of these as possible during the speaker's Q&A. I now would like to hand over to Dr. Crystal Zhang, Associate Professor in Aerospace Engineering and Aviation from RMIT School of Engineering. She will be introducing our speakers. Thank you, Crystal, and over to you. Thank you very much, Marta. Thank you, everyone, uh, especially our European team to organize this. And thank you all for all the speakers to join us today. And of course, thank you for the audience who are here making all yourself available. So today our webinar is about the transformation of the aviation sector. So I think this webinar is very timely in that that aviation is set to boom again after this po uh, COVID pandemic. And, uh, you know, all the organization, in particularly those organizations in aerospace engineering and the aviation sector are working on their workforce planning. So from the uh, organizational perspective, they are talking about the workforce planning, the skill sets, and also from individual's perspective, you are inspired to ensure that you have the skills required by the industry and the society. So today we are so fortunate to have all the distinct speakers from RMIT aerospace engineering and the aviation community and the welcome Welcome to join us. Thank you very much. So our first speaker is uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Jim Parashos. Um, uh, uh, Jim Parashos is the Executive General Manager Aviation at the Brisbane Airport Corporation, the operator of a Brisbane Airport in the third largest Australian city. So uh, he's based in Australia. He is responsible for airside and terminal operations as well as aviation business development and aeronautical commercial. Prior to joining the Brisbane Airport Corporation, Jim was Chief Airport Officer at Northern Territory Airports, responsible for the traditional airport business of operations, commercial aviation development and the customer experience at Darwin and Alice Spring Airports. Um, so Jim also shared with me his uh, personal uh, favorite airports and airlines, and he said that that uh, Singapore Jiangyi Airport is his favorite. It's very efficient and has plenty of things to do for the long layovers and it keeps on reinventing itself. And Singapore Airlines is his uh, most favorite airlines. And he really hoped that we are able to open both domestic and international air travel and he can't wait to uh, have another uh, you know trip to Greece and also a few European um, side trips in European continent and he also shared with us that he loved the toasty salami and the cheese and um, at, at RMIT uh, Jim studied a master of business administration aviation management um, over to you Jim thank you Thank you, Crystal. I, I thought you were going to say uh, um, Brisbane being the, the third busiest airport in Australia because uh, it was announced today that we were actually the busiest airport uh, last financial year. Um, and as uh, I said in an interview, it's something to be pleased but not proud about. I would much rather go back to being the third busiest if we're back to our pre-COVID um, passenger um, traffic. But uh, it has been uh, uh, by far the most challenging times, I think, in, in the aviation uh, industry in the 18 in the last 18 months so i just wanted to to, to share uh, with everyone that's joined uh, a little bit about my personal journey and certainly a little bit um uh on on the outlook um it is, might just go to the next slide uh, i think for for the interest of uh, transparency i might share my personal journey i actually 
a couple of months ago announced uh, uh, to our board and our executive team that I'd be leaving the role and moving back to Melbourne uh, at the end of uh, this year. Um, a lot of pe people ask the question, is it uh, the aviation industry, is it COVID fatigue, to the, which the answer is no. Um, I think uh, I remain um, uh, very optimistic and enthusiastic about the tourism industry, but uh, certainly family factor factors uh, is one thing that um, uh, has come to, to, to mind. So uh, the, the, the journey started in, I grew up in Melbourne, uh, left in my 30s, uh, for what I thought would be two years up in Darwin that turned into 10 years uh, and then for the last five years in Brisbane. So if there's one thing that I'd, I'd, I'd like to say um, to, to those that are listening is uh, that you always have your plans and your ambitions, but uh, you always need to remain flexible because opportunities will present themselves when you least expect them, but it's also equally important um, that you're able to take those opportunities or create those opportunities uh, y yourself. So uh, at the end of the year, I will be um, back in Melbourne exploring new opportunities. If we just go to the next slide, I just thought it'd be worthwhile covering um, my, uh, I suppose, um, education and um, work um, work experience. Um, so uh, I completed a, a business degree at, at Victoria University uh, in the, the mid 90s and I think um, what was interesting, obviously always had a, a passion for tourism and aviation and international trade, um, but I think what really opened the opportunity for me was uh, what I is part of the course, which is a co-op placement. So third year of a fourth year course, went out and worked at Melbourne Airport um, for, for nine months. So probably the thing that I would say there is um, as you're studying, if there are opportunities for placements, uh, internships and, and the like, don't pass them up. It will give you real um, work life experience and, and then also potentially open up um, new doors. Um, so after four years at, at Melbourne Airport, um, and that was an interesting period because that's when the airports went from being uh, government run to privatised. So there was a real um, new um, energy, I suppose, in the aviation sector. Um, I then moved on to uh, Tourism Victoria, which was a government agency, um, um, again, attracting aviation. And after I'd been there for a number of years um, and sort of had a, a couple of, of roles, um, I thought it was time to get back um, to expand, uh, uh, you know, my my knowledge of business and, and education. So I completed my master's at, at um, RMIT. And then after that, the opportunity came up in, in Darwin, um, where I did numerous roles over uh, 10 years. As I said, the intention was for two, but it turned into 10. Uh, and whilst I was, I was there, I also completed a company director's course and an ACI accreditation. And I've been at Brisbane Airport now for almost five years in three, three different roles. So I, I, I suppose the takeout is it's very, it's important to plan, but it's also important uh, uh, to, to appreciate that uh, the, the journey may not always be um, clear. In terms of the industry, we might just go to the next slide. Um, Ines, I think it's very, very early, uh, very easy, I should say, to really get bogged down in the here and, and now. Um, uh, there have been, obviously not to the same scale or, as COVID, but over the years we've had uh, the aviation industry dis disrupted by numerous events. Um, it, it, interesting that uh, last week was the 20th anniversary of the, the of September 11th, seems like yesterday, but also a lifetime ago. We had the SARS pandemic in 2002, 2003. From an Australian viewpoint, um, uh, also the Bali bombings, um, uh, which was really close to, to home, had an impact and of course the global financial crisis. So I suppose what I take out of this is whilst the pandemic, um, uh, we, we've never seen it as bad as we have it uh, today, uh, it will pass and we'll get back to some level of, of normal. Um, so what do I see is the uh, trends and, and, and outlooks? And if we can just skip to the, the, the next one, Ines. Um, before I get into the detail, I just thought I'd share with you these three photos and why they, they're sort of a little bit uh, special and also, um, uh, I think, uh, sharing my optimism. So the photo on uh, the left hand side of the two runways is the dual runway system at Brisbane Airport, uh, which opened on the 20th, sorry, on the 11th of July last year. So four months into the pandemic, we opened up a $1.2 billion investment. 
And a lot of people said, well, if you had your time again, would you open up the new runway? And the answer is yes, because uh, airports, uh, long term businesses, um, the geography um, and, and the separation of people and cargo uh, will remain for, for uh, many times. So uh, that was the new runway uh, opening a, a little over a year ago. The photo on the top right there uh, was when we hosted the IATA slot conference in November 2020. We had 500 people from all over the world come to the airport. And we had a function on the airport before it opened up, uh, which was a pretty unique experience. And also last year, of course, we had Virgin Australia, our second largest airline, go into administration uh, and they've pulled through that. So um, just with these images alone, my uh, comment um, and, and what I want to leave with you is that the industry will bounce back. We have seen um, shocks in the past, and I think quite often uh, aviation has been described as uh, being in constant shock syndrome. If it's not high oil prices, it's some external event, there is something always happening. Now, um, I think to be in the industry, you need to have a level of resilience because these things will continue even after COVID is a long uh, gone memory. In terms of recovery, um, we were hoping to see our domestic market open up um, and be back to normal this year. We think it's probably going to be a year or so behind. And international, um, we don't see bouncing back to pre-COVID levels to 23, 24, but it will come. In terms of the opportunities that have been presented, I think it's been a real um, good time to review business models, both in terms of um, airports, its sub-businesses and the broader aviation business. And equally, I think it's been a real opportunity to fast track initiatives that um, in business that have been really talked about. Um, things like biometric and touchless and, and, and so forth. Uh, there was an announcement yesterday about Australia finally receiving its digital uh, passenger arrival card. That's that that initiative had been talked about for a decade, but now with COVID it's brought the, the um, impetus to, to bring that forward. Uh, and I think um, I think uh, it, what we've been through also reinforces the need um, for, for resilience, um, but things will recover. Um, and finally, in terms of new opportunities, um, I think what we have seen in the last couple of, well, in, in the last year is how dependent um, international air freight is on passenger services, which have now been disrupted, uh, and also the impact that's had on sea freight. Um, it's a little known fact, but um, we have more container ships in Australia that we'll ever send back to the rest of the world, simply because 70% uh, of those containers are, are for imports and there's not much going out at the moment. So I think that will create new opportunities within the air freight market uh, in the short to medium term uh, as we recover. And then finally, the, the, the last slide, please, uh, Ines, um, what are the skills for the new environment? I think essentially it's the skill set that I think should be in any environment. I think um, um, your, your own skills and the attitude that you bring to, to a workplace or whatever you do is really important. And top of that need is resilience. I think business intelligence um, uh, more so than ever before um, has become critical. And I think it's also important because historical data for a little while will not count for much um, as um, things have been disrupted. Um, you know, leisure markets will not come back the same way that they operated in the past. Uh, um, so it's really important to have the latest information and to interpret that. Uh, from an individual perspective, I think it's important to have an inquisitive mind. Um, uh, I think uh, data recall is, is important. Uh, the way you, um, you understand, interpret, um, and story tell um, that, that data, I think, is, is important, particularly in the business um, uh, business development viewpoint. And I think finally, it's important to really challenge yourself, step outside your comfort zone and try new things. So um, that's, that's my feedback to um, the attendees today, Crystal. Thank you very much, Jim, for uh, sharing your experience with us. Uh, of course, congratulations to your achievements for making the uh, Brisbane Airport the third business airport. Uh, so it's credited to yours and the Brisbane Airport. And uh, of course, that I can uh, resonate with you that actually throughout your career life, there could be a lot of twists, but you need to plan. You need to have a plan in place and you have to craft your plan accordingly. And also, thank you very much for sharing uh, with us that your very optimistic 
optimistic attitudes towards the industry, and that really gives us, you know, the kind of assurance uh, from a, a, a very uh, industry professional perspective. And also, you you talk about the skill sets. You know, you talk about the challenges uh, that the individual uh, uh, need to have. You need to take yourself out of your comfort zone. So that's really important. And thank you very much, Jim, for sharing with us. Um, so let's uh, come to the next speaker. So our next speaker is uh, Mr. John Skelly. Uh, John Skelly is currently the business development director at Airbus. So he's currently based in France. And thank you very much because of the time difference. I'll uh, thank you for making the efforts to join us. Um, so John's experience in the aviation industry has been uh, seen him working with a global portfolio of CEOs, CFOs and board of directors to bring sales and the lease agreements to uh, close. I can imagine that could be very challenging. You talk to different people to make sure that the contract is signed. Uh, so John's current role as a business development director with Airbus sees him develop and implement integrated commercial strategy plans to significantly increase the Airbus air freight market share. And that perhaps reflect what Jim has talked about the uh, recovery or the resilience of the air freight market. So John's first position with Airbus was a marketing director in the passenger airline sector where he made a significant contribution. So John also shared with me his favorite airlines and airports. So his airport's favorite airport is the uh, Turkish Airlines lounge in Istanbul airport with its pool table. Even his son loves that. He also likes Munich airport, which is very well organized. He likes Qantas. Uh, most and of course Etihad and the Emirates A380s are his um, perhaps most favorite um, aircraft. So are they still in market in the future, John? Um, of yes. course, I'm so lucky um, that um, the borders are open in France already and uh, he has made his plans and booked his ticket. So he's really uh, he's traveling to Moscow next week and then Baku. Exciting journey it is. Um, so and of course he wants to come back to Australia welcome. Um, he shared with me um, his uh, uh, his uh, favorite uh, snack, which is dried dark sausage for Apti Riff. So welcome, you are welcome to try. Over to you, John. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. So of course, um, we are expecting to see the A380 back in service. And what is fantastic about the Etihad and Emirates A380s is they both have a bar on board, which I enjoy very much. It's a great place to meet people and it's one of the best ways you can spend time in an aircraft. So thank you for your time. Um, first question, what do I do? So I sell aircraft uh, for Airbus, I sell freighter aircraft and I sell conversions. So a conversion is when you take an aging passenger aircraft and you convert it into a freighter aircraft. And for us, business is booming. Um, my team has taken on five people uh, since the beginning of COVID from internal people from within Airbus because some of the other departments aren't working as much, but um, everybody wants a freighter aircraft today. So if we can go to the next slide. Why is air freight so important? So in terms of tonnage, air freight is quite small. It only takes about 1% of all tonnage of all world freight. If you have a look at the picture of the container ship you know what they look like and they have tens of thousands of containers on board each ship. But of that 1% of tonnage that's transported um, by aircraft, it, it is worth 35% of the value of all freight transported. So very expensive equipment, um, very expensive goods, fresh goods are all transported by air freight. Uh, that's a ratio of 35 to 1 is enormous. Some of uh, some figures for you. So 8% of all aircraft uh, in service are freight aircraft. Freighters carry some 54% of all air cargo, but the rest of the air cargo is carried in belly freight. And because all of the passenger aircraft are grounded at the moment, uh, freighter aircraft are, are heavily in demand. It's, it's difficult to get hold of a freighter for a short term today. The market split looking at the Asia Pacific region makes up for about 34% of all global air traffic. So it really is uh, a market that's moving at the moment and especially in the Australasia region. Can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, next slide. 
So this is the Airbus freighter product portfolio. Now, as I said, uh, I also sell conversions. If we have a look on the bottom left hand of the screen, you see the A320 and the A321. So these aircraft to be converted, each one costs about six million US dollars. We have, of course, the A33200 production freighter, uh, which we sold up till 2015. And now we also have conversions for A33200 and A33300 aircraft from passenger to freighter aircraft. A conversion of one of these aircraft costs around 20 million. And finally, as you've, you've heard in the press, I can't even show you a photo of it because I'm not allowed to, but that aircraft is an A350 passenger aircraft and we have announced that we will be producing and selling an A350 freighter aircraft. Now, this is a very exciting project. Again, I can't talk a whole lot about it, but understand that uh, me and my team have been working on this project for quite some time. If we go to the next slide, please. So you'll see um, the kind of numbers of A350s that we've sold so far. Now, keep in mind an A350 is worth some $200 million in aircraft. So we sell 915 aircraft. That's an enormous amount of money. So far, we've delivered some 416 aircraft and we have a backlog of some 500 aircraft to go. The market size for the A350 freighter aircraft we expect over the next 10 years to be some 500 aircraft. So we're competing with the uh, the 777 freighter aircraft, of course, but it's a very exciting market and it is booming. Next slide, please. So passenger to freighter conversions, just to explain this a little bit because they're quite important. So um, we are the OEM, we are the original equipment manufacturer. And we are in partnership with EFW in Dresden and ST Aerospace in Singapore. And these are all aircraft uh, you can see that have been converted, except for the A320. The A320 is a prototype still in conversion. But uh, there are now two A321 P2Fs in service with uh, Qantas. DHL has quite a big fleet and a growing fleet of A330 300 P2Fs. Next slide, please. So just a quick few words on how do I get here? I'm not very good at talking about myself, but I'll have a go. Um, what's important to know is not that my career path is particular, but just have a look at some of the elements and think about how that could apply to you and your personal circumstances. So I started um, on the design and certification of an aircraft called the Moyes Ultralight. That was with Moyes um, hang gliding company in Sydney. This was a tiny aircraft. It has a maximum takeoff weight of 350 kilograms. And uh, they had designed and built the aircraft, but they needed somebody to help get it on the path to certification. So I got in touch with the certification authorities in Melbourne and started to negotiate on their behalf. Then uh, I had an offer from Eagle Aircraft in Perth. Now this was a two seater a uh, composite aircraft. I uh, was working in the design team, the prototyping team, and then um, in the flight test even. So this was a fantastic job. I would design parts, uh, send them to the shop floor where they would get made up. I would then inspect them, have them installed on the aircraft, and sometimes I would even fly on the aircraft to to help uh, test the test whatever I designed. So fantastic job, great fun. From there, Eagle Aircraft um, went out of business and I took the chance to sail from Australia to South Africa on a 40 foot yacht. And when I got to South Africa, I started working for uh, CSI Pretoria, which is the equivalent of the CSIRO in Africa, doing research into loads and narrow elastics and flight tests uh, for mostly military applications. I didn't want to stay in South Africa forever. I got the chance to study my master's degree in France. So I came to France and um, after finishing my studies, I got a job with uh, LMS in, in Reutlingen in Germany. Now LMS is a company um, that produces software to create finite element models. And this was work lastly in the car, mostly in the car industry. This was really a project work. It helped me get my permission to work 
in uh, Europe, and from there I moved to Fairchild Dornia. Now, Fairchild Dornia, uh, again, an aircraft manufacturer and designer, and here I worked as an engineer in loads and aeroelastics, um, and then into flight test. Uh, and I finished working at Fairchild Dornia in 2002 when they went out of business, and then I joined Airbus. So overall, um, I've lived in some seven countries during my, my travels in Australia, Belgium, France, Germany, Indonesia, South Africa, and the UK. In total, I've visited some 63 countries. Most of, many of those have been as part of my job with Airbus. Can we go to the next slide, please? So it's, it's not quite true that I joined um, Airbus in marketing. That, uh, I joined Airbus in 2003 in engineering and I was an engineer for a very big part of my career. I started in, in loads and aeroelastics in Hamburg. Uh, then I went on to flight test. Um, and after that, I uh, worked uh, I worked in flight test, which was very interesting. I worked uh, on the flight certification of the A330 aircraft, which was a fantastic project. When that project finished, I moved on to research and worked in Clean Sky, which is a um, a consortium of companies of which Airbus is one doing research Europe wide into um, advanced methods for reducing fuel burn. Then I joined, then I, I wanted to move on from engineering and here I decided to do an MBA. I was trying to decide whether to stay in flight test or or whether to, um, to go into the commercial world. In flight test, everybody was young, everybody coming up. Uh, it's, a, it's a good area for, for people to come into, but in commercial, everybody had gray hair. And I thought, well, okay, I'm starting to get a few gray hairs, so maybe it's a good thing for me to, to go off and try to sell aircraft. So I joined um, airline marketing and looked after Asia Pacific and India regions. And after doing that for some years, I then uh, joined the um, freighter team as a business development director uh, where I am today. And like I said, the airline marketing part of the company has slowed down quite a lot. We, we didn't lose anybody during COVID. We managed to keep everybody in the team. We had a few people who chose to go, who chose to retire early, but um, nobody was fired. And uh, business development uh, in freighters, like I said, has grown and is, uh, is still very busy today. So to give you an idea of um, the kind of workload I have, 2019, which was the last normal year, uh, I did some 17 trips. I spent um, 90 days out of my contract for 211 days a year traveling. So that's that's two working days out of five. And um, in that year, I went to Bonn, Miami, Tokyo, Sydney, Moscow, Munich, Paris, Frederickshafen, Singapore, Manila, San Diego, Dublin, and Dresden. So we do move around quite a lot in, in my area. Next slide, please. If you're finding that it's difficult to find work at the moment and you decide that you want to do some extra studies, I think this is an excellent idea. Um, OK, so these are the institutions that I studied in. And again, not important where I studied, but maybe it gives you some ideas. So if you've done uh, an engineering degree or a science degree, I can strongly recommend if you've got time on your hands to think about doing a master's degree or think about doing an MBA. The combination of engineering and business is very powerful. Something like 40% of all MBA undergraduates are engineers. So um, I really think it's a, it's a good idea to, to consider doing uh, financial studies or, or an MBA in particular. Another thing to consider doing is learning a language. So I, of course, learned French. Um, my German's OK, but not as good as my French. Uh, so think of going to the Alliance Francaise or, or thinking of what language might help you uh, move forward and where you might want to study somewhere in the future. One thing uh, I tried studying during my MBA, which I decided wasn't really my thing, but it was worth trying, was uh, entre entrepreneurship. And if this is something, this appeals, entrepreneurship appeals to a lot of people and it might be time for you to think of, of starting up your, your own enterprise. So um, do give that some thought. And if you, if you still have time on your hands, think about flying something. I find it very useful to have a background as a pilot. I fly uh, small aircraft, I have my PPL, 
but I also very much enjoy glider flying. And having a PPL can be quite expensive. If you're a student, that can be restrictive, but flying gliders is much cheaper. It's a great way to learn flying, and it'll put you in contact with a lot of people who have an interest in flying and have an interest um, in the industry. So uh, we had a, one person asked if um, we could recommend any particular software that it's worthwhile knowing. Well, uh, software is quite important. Uh, if you're wanting to get into sales and commercial, then I can strongly recommend learning how to use um, Salesforce. If you're in engineering, I can strongly recommend learning Katia. Um, and very much in, in everything I've done, know how to use Excel extremely well. Learn what pivot tables are and how to use them. And if you can program macros in Excel, you'll always be doing uh, something very useful for yourself. So those, those are some tips that I can think of in terms of uh, what software you might find interesting. Okay, well, that's it for me. Thank you very much for your time. And I hand it back to you, Crystal. Um, thank you. Thank you, John. That's very, uh, very appreciative to share your personal experience and also your uh, work experience journey. And this, in my view, is absolutely a testimonial to what uh, Jim has uh, shared with us. He said that you have to take any opportunity and you have to create an, any opportunity that could be available for you. So I think your experience working in different type of uh, aircraft manufacturing, maintenance, maintenance uh, facilities, and traveling to different countries to create the opportunity for you to pursue your career is absolutely a, a great uh, testimonial to show to our graduates that um, you know you need to uh, make your sh make sure that you are ready whenever the opportunity is there. Um, so it's really interesting also to see that um, you know you give us the snapshot of the uh, A350. So uh, we had a lot of discussion about the uh, post-COVID uh, market recovery. We talk about the ultra long haul, the long Hall. So perhaps we, A350 is one of the uh, preferred aircraft uh, by the airline. So we really look forward to that aircraft coming into the market. And thank you for all your efforts, uh, you know, in uh, promoting that aircraft to the airline, to the aviation community. Um, so again, so John uh, did his uh, bachelor degree of, of engineering, aerospace engineering with RMIT. And then he did, as he said himself, that he did, uh, you know, quite some uh, other courses and the degrees, uh, you know, it's, it's a great combination of the technical expertise skills uh, with the uh, with the uh, management leadership skills. So it's a great share. Thank you very much, uh, John, for sharing with us. So I'm happy to introduce our last speaker, who is um, uh, uh, the uh, 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 Miss uh, Sarah Kaumita. So Sarah is an executive and a lifestyle coach at uh, Pivot Point. Uh, Sarah is based in Hong Kong and she is a coach and a wellness practitioner uh, ready to help build resilience, uh, cultivate awareness and breathe authenticity. Uh, he, uh, she has worked very hard and played harder uh, for 15 years in the corporate world with uh, VVIPs in the private jet industry across North America and Asia. And Sarah understands the hidden dangers of high performance and the impact it has on people's lives, both personally and professionally. Professionally. Um, so at RMIT, Sarah is an advisory board member for the Bachelor of Applied Science Aviation. Uh, Sarah also shared with me uh, her uh, personal uh, reference preference for airports and airlines. So uh, Dubai is her most favorite airport, and Cathay Pacific is her most favorite airlines. Uh, maybe she said because she lives in Hong Kong, she has to uh, take um, you know uh, Cathay Pacific for long haul travel. Um, but uh, if we talk about the generally about the airlines, etc, etc, she said that Singapore Airlines is her favorite. And uh, if the international travel ban uh, would be lifted, she would like to visit her home in uh, uh, Chicago and uh, Sedona in America. And of course, she wants to visit Greece and Egypt. Um, and in terms of her snack, she likes chocolate peanut butter filled pretzel bites. So welcome to try. And she warns that could be dangerous, but very tasty. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Crystal. I really love these introductions to everybody. And thank you as well for the gentleman sharing before. I love what you've shared. And I'll have a little bit of overlap, but talking about entrepreneurial skills, that's exactly what I'll be sharing with you guys today on having an entrepreneurial mindset in aviation. So if we can go to the next slide. Last year in 2020, I found myself in the boat as many where I lost my job. But I had also lost my job in 2008 during the global financial crisis. So this time I had awareness of my environment. And as I was exiting the industry, I was looking at what are my options and what could I do? And so I was very inspired by this Rosie the Riveter image and started my company called Pivot Point. And on social media, I'm known as Sarah the Pivoter. And so you can see a, a play on words here that shift happens and it will happen again and again. And as I'm not sure if it was Jim or John who mentioned, we will always have these crises that we will go through and there will always be big events in aviation. Let's go to the next slide. I will give a little bit of background on my history, but first I'd like you to, they will um, put up a mentee slide and you will be able to scan a QR code so we can get how you guys feel about the current situation for aviation. I like to use this image because as you can see, there's some people in the front that are really not happy about it and they're really scared. There's other people who are super excited and you know, back in, in number five, they're hiding. So if we can get that loaded for everyone. Um, in the meantime, I'll talk a little bit about my career trajectory. I went to Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University and I studied business. So my degree was an aviation business degree. I also studied Asian studies and learned Mandarin at school, which was what launched my career in Asia after I lost my job in 2008, because I had that language and understanding of the culture to be able to come over where I am now. I've been in Hong Kong for the last nine years, but I was in Shanghai, Beijing and Singapore prior to that for a total of 11 years here in Asia. And during that time, my career in aviation has been on the business jet sector. So quite different to the other two speakers today. And so I was working with corporate jets for the aircraft management companies. We were managing the asset for owners, making sure that when they flew on the trips, they had the permits they needed. We scheduled the maintenance, ensured the crew had their appropriate training and dealed well with the regulators. And so this really gave me a very well-rounded view of how flying an aircraft works. I also had studied flying at school, but I did not get my PPL, but I do encourage those of you who might have some spare time on your hands to certainly take advantage of this opportunity. Looks like there might be some issues with the mentee slide, so don't worry about that. We'll just continue on with the presentation. I'm very good at being agile and pivoting even when there's technical issues. So this is definitely a transferable skill that you guys want to have for yourself. Wonderful. So we've got some results here. Keep on putting your answers in there. Being able to handle a situation under pressure is going to be crucial for your success in aviation and really in any industry. If you are thinking about entrepreneurship, this is also definitely a skill you'll need. To be in aviation or not, whether you're studying it, I used to talk to students and help them pivot into careers in aviation for the last five years. And so by the same token, I can help pivot into other industries where you can bolster your skill set if the market is not so attractive when you graduate and you can pivot back into the industry when the time is right and there are better opportunities. So it's really about adapting our mindset. We are not what we do, but we are how we behave. How are you going to behave in this situation when there is an economic downturn, when there are not as many jobs as you would like or in the field, the exact field that you are hoping? It's about being able to understand what are your values and knowing that control is an illusion. Struggling against reality and going against the current will only waste your energy rather than allowing yourself to sometimes realign, point your canoe back downstream and let the flow of life take you in a different direction. At the end of the day, you may still be able to end up where you originally intended and it may take a year, may take five years, may take 10 years and that's absolutely okay. I'm walking proof that you can pivot after 15 years in one industry and start up in another. So pivot point I started last year. It's my coaching practice where I help people to change their mind and have success strategy for long term sustainable success. And I also launched an e-commerce business completely unrelated to aviation. 
I also studied an MBA and graduated last year. And so I decided I have time on my hands. I have a product that's come across my lap that is changing lives. Why don't I bring it to market and see what I can do with it? And so now Aveda Limited is born. You guys can Google that later and see what that's all about, but it's completely unrelated to aviation. So what we have to remember is sometimes in order to go back to the ship, we need to build a new one. And that is completely OK. We don't always want to be on the same roller coaster ride in life. Sometimes we want to go on a bit of a carousel, just nice up and down, nice music. Other times we want that real exhilarating roller coaster. And so now we're back at the slides. Perfect pivot and segue back into here. So when you build up your transferable skills, you want to be resilient. You want to be emotionally intelligent. So being aware of what others might be experiencing. And this is tied into how you behave. So if you can manage yourself and learn to create calm, even in the midst of chaos, you will be in a better place in a better position when things and shift hits the fan. We want to learn how to adapt and learn new things. So if you look at this graph over the last 30 years, we've had many crises. As was mentioned before, there was SARS, there was 9-11, you know, the Middle Eastern financial crisis, but then COVID is where we see that dropped completely down. And so this is unprecedented, the black swan event, but it will take time to recover. It will not be a quick recovery. And so being aware of your environment will be critical. There were a lot of people last year that refused to face reality and continue to hope that things would get better in a week, in a month's time. And here we are almost two years later. If you can go to the next slide, please. So stressed and unhappy people are unproductive. As you start your careers, it will be critically important for you to look at your well-being. And as you become leaders of teams of other people, understanding that they are not just robots, making sure that they have time to manage their energy, be with their families and reset so that they can be the best value at work. I can tell you in my last role at Universal Weather and Aviation, we dealt with aircraft on the ground. So we were towing multi-million dollar aircraft and we had to implement fatigue management systems because the teams in certain locations were not managing the staff properly and they'd work 18 hour shifts, go home to sleep for four hours and come back and do it again the next day. Now, why is this a critical issue? Well, if you're fatigued, studies actually show it's like being under the influence of alcohol. Your cognitive function is impaired. You have delayed reaction time, and that's not something you want in an environment towing expensive machinery because you will have damages, expenses, which could shut your business down, and of course, injury, which we do not want. So looking at what you have, what you want in the future, making sure that it's in aligned with your values. Network, I cannot stress this enough. Make sure that you network. Your network is your net worth. Whether you work in a corporate environment or decide to start your own business, using tools like LinkedIn, and yes, even now Facebook and Instagram to help promote your personal brand as well as your business will be crucial for your success. And thank you. The next slide, future. So I always like to look at this slide because we don't know what the future looks like. This is what we have now. This information was from last year. In 20 years, it could look radically different. No one could have predicted COVID in 2020. When New Year's was hitting in 2019, we had no idea we'd be here today. But if we look at drones, this is actually one of the solutions for an environment where we have reduced flying, we have social distancing requirements, and obviously the quarantine rules and testing, which dramatically impact how easy it is to travel. And the applications for drones as technology continues to increase, as you can see here, are going to be in multiple areas. And so thinking about whether it's coding the drones, whether it's being a drone flyer, whether it's being the people on the ground, you know, there are so many other opportunities. And we often forget that in aviation, it's not just about flying airplanes and being a flight attendant and then fixing the airplanes. We still need accountants. We still need marketing. We need people who understand digital marketing over print marketing as that continues to be phased out. And we, we will have new jobs that will appear every year. Five years ago, you would not have hired a company to manage your social media accounts. Now it's a service that I myself use for both my businesses so that I pay somebody else to take that off. It's like delegating when you're a leader. So these are the most critical skills that I can impress upon you while you guys are studying. And as you're exiting the industry, you really want to, excuse me, your um, 
studies and going into the industry, you want to have that network. You can't go to an ATM and pull out a million dollars as much as we all love that. So we need to invest in our relationships. We need to nurture and cultivate them. So if you can treat the people in your network, whether they're mentors, coaches, friends, people that you meet at events, you start to nurture them now. You are curious, ask questions. People love to talk about themselves and their experience. And so you ask questions, build a relationship, and when the time comes, you will either be forefront in their mind for an opportunity, or you will have created an opportunity simply by having the conversation and being proactive to reach out. Next slide. So here are some questions to ask that can help you guys get started. You really want to understand what your values are because you can use this like a guiding compass. Understanding where you want to be spending your time and how do you carve that into your day, into your week. Making sure that whatever you don't want to be spending your time on, you, you delegate or you simply remove it. If it's not adding value or helping you achieve your goals, it's not worth keeping around. And so sometimes we have to let go of things, even if we've done them for 15 years, in order to make space for something new. This is extremely important as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, but also managing an airport, running an airline, working for a manufacturer. You need to understand what's going on in the environment and what's working and what's not working. So reflection is very important. Next slide. And so this is just a, a image I like to show because we have the propeller aircraft, very old school, very iconic. And then we have, you know, these um, concept ideas for aircraft that will be using different engine systems, different types of fuel, and remembering that it's always crazy until it's done. But if we're open and we're curious, then we can work together and learn from each other and go through crisis. Um, I see some questions here about aviation graduates kickstarting their careers in this economy. Again, networking, reaching out to people who are still in aviation right now and asking them how the environment is. What are the top things that they suggest? Seeking out mentors, seeking out people that would be happy to have a 15 minute conversation with you. I can tell you that I got my job here in Hong Kong through LinkedIn networking. So if there's one thing you remember from me today, please go and set up your LinkedIn if you have not already. Make sure you have a professional profile on there, that you have a headline that captures attention and you tell a story. Make me intrigued to want to connect with you and ask for your CV. Don't just copy your CV on there. If you start building up your LinkedIn network and your profile, this is how you're going to be able to learn from experts, not just where you're based physically, but also around the world in webinars such as this one. Join different groups, ask questions in those groups and learn from the experts. And then you'll start to be able to see for yourself where those opportunities best fit for you because sometimes it's the right opportunity, maybe it's the right job, but it's on the wrong bus or the wrong airplane, if you will, the wrong Airbus. So you wanna make sure you're on the right seat, going in the right direction. Sometimes you're in the right seat, but on the wrong airplane and you change airplanes and all of a sudden it's the right fit for you because that company culture is aligned with your values. So this is what I'd like to share with you guys today. If you have any more questions in the Q&A section, I'll be happy to chime in. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, Sarah, for sharing your personal experience. And I can say absolutely that you are a role model. You have demonstrated the greatest properties as an entrepreneur and a female, um, you know, aviator. So uh, you have the adaptability and you are doing the lifelong learning and you have demonstrated the resilience and you are doing the network. So which is uh, fantastic uh, for our graduates to, you know, to take away wisdom. Um, so uh, thank you. That's really great to have you sharing uh, with us your personal experience. So to summarize, I think from the three speakers, uh, my personal observation is really as a graduate, as a, a fresh graduate from the university. So you need to, um, you know, enrich your personal experience, um, whatever kind of opportunity that are available, grab it. So if there is no opportunity, so you need to do something to create an opportunity to ensure that you have some experience. The next is that you need to have some transferable skills and what other transferable skills 
transferable skills. Um, so whether you have the expert, uh, the technical expertise, you have the uh, business management skills, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera, but make sure that you are a lifelong learner. Make sure that you are always inspired to develop some new skills that are required by the industry and the society. So the next properties perhaps would be, um, you know, your uh, adaptability and your resilience and make sure that you are always networking and you have a role model to, um, you know, to to work, to learn from and make sure that you uh, get everything ready when the opportunity is there. So thank you again for sharing with us your personal experience and, you know, which uh, I'm sure is very inspirational for our graduates. So now I'm opening for the Q&A and uh, let's see what other questions here are available for us. Um, before I take any um, questions from the Q&A, I actually would like to ask the three um, um, uh, panelists to share with us. Um, you know, you have more than 10 or 20, 30 years of experience working in different sectors across the industry or, you know, in different industries and you change jobs. So I'm sure that when you were young in your 20s or before you, you went to the university, you had a lot of you know, advices, suggestions from your parents, from your teachers, etc, etc. So do you always take their advice? So what exactly is the most effective uh, uh, approach that you think that would work for you, that you do take advice or you are not taking advice? I'll start with Jim, you are the first speaker. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Crystal. Um, I, I suppose uh, I grew up uh, with a family that had its own small business and it was a, a case of you create your own destiny in, in many ways. You don't, you're not working for a big corporation. Um, uh, so my, my view on that is, or what I've taken from it is a number one resilience, number two hard work. But I think number three is if, if you are at any point working in, in an organization, treat it like your own business almost. Um, I often say to people, pretend that it's your money that you're spending when you're making decisions with it within a business. Don't, don't have the attitude, well, it's a company. Make yourself part of it. So um, that's probably the, the key message that, that, that I'll, I would take. Uh, um, you know, wh whatever organisation you're, you're in, pretend you own it and you're, and you're running the whole show. Thank you, Jim. That's very good advice. Um, uh, John. So for me, it's always been important to think about what you really want and then go for that. Um, when I started engineering, my father wasn't sure it was a brilliant idea because it, it's a lot of work. But when I, I spoke to the professors at RMIT and they told me that 67% uh, of students were hired uh, before they had even left RMIT, that, uh, that, that gave me a lot of reassurance and it was the case for me. I uh, had my job before I, I graduated from RMIT, so that worked very well. And then when I wanted to leave um, engineering and join commercial, uh, the first per or one of the first people I went and saw was the head of human resources at uh, a commercial at Airbus. And uh, I told him my plan and he told me, forget it. He, he actually said, forget it, this is never going to work. So um, he's, he's left the company now, but uh, and I never had a chance to show him my business card. But if I ever meet him, that, that, that's what I'm going to do. So I knew I wanted to get into commercial. Uh, it interested me. Um, it was an awful lot of work to choose the right university to, to do the MBA. And uh, because I put a lot of work into it, the company ended up sponsoring me for my MBA. So um, that, that really worked very well. But that was only because I, I pushed for it. And it, it took a couple of years from the day I decided this is what I want to do to the day I was uh, at HSC in Paris. Um, was was about two and a half years. So plans take time to make, but um, really think about what you want to do. It's your decision that's going to affect your life and um, and stick with it. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you for sharing with us, uh, Sarah. I, I love those, both of those examples and I wholeheartedly agree with you, John. Uh, you need to really be clear on what you want. What I see with a lot of people is they don't actually understand what they want. They don't know their core values. And so they go through life achieving things. They, they get many accomplishments. They go up the corporate ladder, you know, or they start a business, they earn a lot of money, and yet they're still unfulfilled and unsatisfied because they're chasing the wrong things. 
and they're looking in the wrong areas for the fulfillment. So being crystal clear on what you want and then going for it is number one. Number two is understanding the difference between motivation and discipline. Motivation is like a battery. It will run out and it does need to be recharged. Even when you love something very, very passionately, at some point you will be overwhelmed, you'll be drained and you'll sit there wondering, is it even worth it? But when you're disciplined, you then set a habit and you're consistent in your actions that even on those tough days when it feels like the odds are stacked against you, you still put the, your head down, you still take one tiny step moving in that direction that you want to go in. And then number three is understanding that things may change. You may start with one goal in mind, and if along the way you start to realize, hey, I'm not so sure this is for me, this is not exactly what I thought it was, um, or I was enjoying it and now I'm interested in a different area, that is okay. Give yourself permission to explore different areas, different sections, maybe within the same firm if there's you know, job transfer ability so that you can learn and expand your knowledge base. And then you continually refine and realign. So one thing that we most often forget is in our quest for success, we're looking forward at the goals that we've set, but we don't take time to stop and reflect at everything that's happened so far. So we fail to recognize what we have accomplished and we're not even sure if it's the right fit and we just go on this kind of autopilot, if you will. So those are my um, three step recommendations for our students. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing with us. You are absolutely right. So uh, let's look at the questions posted by the attendees. So the first one I can see here is what transformative change is needed to better prepare aviation for future pandemic pandemics and the continued uncertainty faced by the industry? So I'll post this question to uh, John. OK, so um, for me, the, the biggest transformation we need is uh, vaccination strategies uh, globally. Uh, countries really need to have solid vaccination strategies going into the future. This may not be the last pandemic um, and we, we need to be better prepared. Uh, Bill Gates did have um, uh, an idea some years ago that there would be a pandemic coming up. Not many people listened to him, but at the time it was very hard to listen to him. But now uh, I think it's quite clear that we, we need solid vaccination strategies. And the other thing we need is uh, vaccination acceptance because there's still a big part of the world um, who are not ready to, to accept the, the need personally uh, to get vaccinated. And the only way out of this crisis is with um, vaccination strategies and acceptance of vaccinations. And I think this is a lesson we shouldn't forget. Thank you, John. So I'll move on to the next question, given that we've got really some interesting questions. So I'll uh, uh, allocate to different uh, panelists. So the next one is that what is your number one tip for graduating students who would like to start a career in aviation in light of the impact that COVID has had on our industry? I'll post this to Jim. Jim. Sure. I think it's a really good question and, and uh, one I think that in some ways answers itself. Um, uh, if you're planning to be in aviation and the, the whole COVID scenario um, uh, has thrown you off, uh, perhaps it's not the industry for, for you is the, 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 the comment that I would make. Whilst COVID in itself has, has had a significant impact, it will not be the last. Um, so if, if it's a smooth sailing, um, um, sort of easygoing, um, not too turbulent environment that you're keen to, to work in, I'd, I'd suggest, you know, accounting or something like that. And I, and I don't say it lightheartedly, it is, we can't get caught up in the current COVID uh, situation. It will pass and there'll be other challenges going forward. So, so I think um, uh, preparing mentally for the fact that, uh, yes, it's tough now, you want to break into the industry, you want your first job, great, but um, that's that's not going to be the end of the, the, the challenges, if you like. Thank Crystal, you, Jeeves. Could I, Crystal, could I make a comment on that? Sure, absolutely, <clears throat> absolutely. Yeah, go so on. What, well, one thing I'd like to say to, um, to anybody looking at a career in the in industry right now is don't forget air freight. Air freight is booming. If you're in Australia, 
think about DHL, think about Kuna Nagel, um, think about joining the, the equipment manufacturers. Um, air freight has is, is, is become a, a much bigger industry than it was um, some years ago, and it, it's a, it's a flavour that's going to stay with us. A lot of people now use companies like Amazon far more than they, they ever have done in the past, and this is a trend that, uh, that's going to stay. We're expecting e-commerce, the growth that we've seen in e-commerce was a real spurt growth, but it continues to grow solidly. And uh, there is a lot of work uh, out there to be done uh, in air freight. So this is my idea. Yeah, thank you, John. And I think that I would like to add uh, a few words to that uh, uh, answer to, to that question. Perhaps we need to redefine uh, the word of aviation career. So uh, when we talk about aviation career, we uh, we tend to think about it's only airlines, airports or aircraft manufacturer, et cetera, et cetera. But Sarah's personal experience and your or your uh, our panel's uh, work, work experience demonstrate that actually we need to expand the, the 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 scope of aviation it covers it embraces a lot of uh, you know players throughout the supply chain of aviation could be the tour operators could be the freight market you know could be the corporate jet could be you know all the other uh, you know players in the market which perhaps not necessarily covered in much more detail in your study in the university but that's something perhaps you need to explore by yourself by networking perhaps talking to industry people so that's something I also want to add to that. Thank you very much for that. Uh, the other question I can see that has been covered by John in your presentation, the software skills are incredibly advantages and what's the single one. So I will skip to skip that one. The other one is most the pilots and ATC have had a reduced workload during the pandemic, resulting in less opportunities to practice English language in the work environment. Will there be a greater need for aviation English refresher training to maintain IKO English language proficiency requirements? I'll post this one to Sarah, given that you have had a different working experience with corporate uh, and you have a degree from um, Rio Rito, uh, you know, aviation business management, and now you're working as a coach. So what do you think? This is a great question. Um, I think like with any skill, if we're not practicing it, then it's not going to be very good, right? The time, if you do something once a month, then your skill level is not going to be as good as someone who spends every day five minutes because they have the muscle memory. It's become part of their automatic uh, routine. It's no longer taking so much energy for them to recall this information. It's just like driving a car. When you first start driving a car, your brain is trying to put everything together or piloting an aircraft, right? You're trying to look at all of the dials, you're turning knobs, turning on the blinker or talking to the air tower, right? So in the beginning, this is stressful. And as you say, if you're not using this IKO level English, then you might have um, a worse level when you come back. So I'm not sure if this applies to you, but for anyone whose English is not their first language, if there is no IKO level training out there, I would encourage you to get together with other people in a similar situation and just practice amongst yourselves. A lot of times we wait for things to happen for us, but we can actually take action and create these opportunities instead. You never know, perhaps you, you get a group together and it can turn into a business. That often happens. What started out as friends getting together to practice something or to do something and then catches on and you know you see the need in the market and nobody else is doing it and you might be able to be the first player there. So I would definitely encourage you to practice, you know, review the material, practice speaking in your mirror at yourself, record yourself. One of the top tips for getting comfortable with public speaking and being able to be under pressure and still recall information and handle difficult situations is to practice those events happening. And if you record yourself, you'll then be able to catch what you might have said incorrectly and understand why you need to practice that more, or you might be able to see you know, areas of improvement where there's gaps. So that's what I would um, recommend with regards to the IKO English. And then just to jump back to the last question, 
one of the things we also need to remember is, you know, accounting. Maybe that's not your favorite thing, but if you're good with numbers, you can go and be an accountant at an aviation firm and at least start to understand this company's culture. Maybe right now they can't hire a big team, but they still need somebody to do the accounting or to support with expense reports. Even if it's a very, what you might perceive as low level or basic entry level position, this allows you an opportunity to build relationships with people in that environment. And then they already know you. They, you, you ask questions, they see that you're curious and you have learning potential. And if you can identify other things that you can add value, they're more likely to keep you or push you into another position as it opens rather than hiring an unknown. This happened very, very frequently. Business aviation is a lot smaller when you compare it to air freight or airlines, um, but we had a very tight network. I actually have never applied for a job formally in the business aviation network, except for my very first one. After right. that, it, it was always an invitation to apply because I had already made an impression with that team or company. And so this is what we mean when we say you can create opportunities. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for sharing that. So uh, given the time available, I will only take two more questions. So the first one. Um, so what has been done by the aviation industry collaborating with universities in preparing industry ready graduates? So uh, Jim, you want to share your experience? Yeah, look, um, great question um, because um, we're certainly conscious that as an industry, we're going to need people coming through uh, as we recover. Uh, there are some people that have left the industry, so we've um, maintained really close uh, re relationships. I know um, at the moment we have uh, a another university up here in Queensland that we're running a program around um, a research program for ground handling um, and what that might look like in, in, in the future. Um, and also conscious that, um, and, um, as we recover, and it goes back to the earlier question, um, you know, whether it's remaining proficient or current on language, we also have people that are working on airport that haven't used equipment, aero bridges for some time, and there'll be a need for, for restarts. So we do a lot with Griffith and Queensland University that are our, our local universities here, and also um, have aviation sectors. And I think a lot of um, airports and, and uh, aviation industry players are also doing the same. Thank you. It's great to know. Uh, so, John, do you have anything as one of the biggest uh, aircraft manufacturers? Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, well, Airbus, we have a lot of programs with universities around the world. Uh, we have the Fly Your Ideas competition, which um, has uh, undergraduates from hundreds of, of institutions around the world applying and we we pay an awful lot of attention uh, to um, preparing graduates and to say especially uh, increasing the number of female graduates uh, interested in, in aerospace is uh, is quite important so Airbus certainly puts in a lot of work uh, in this in this domain um, and we we have a number of programs not just fly your ideas that that target uh, graduates from aerospace and business universities. Fantastic. It's great to know that you're all working with the universities so we can see that there will be a lot of opportunities for our graduates. So given the time, I'll just take one last question. I'll combining a couple of questions which ask the actually the similar thing. So um, and that is you know, how exactly you network in aviation, for example, you're using Sarah talk about using LinkedIn. So what is the best way to connect and network with people in aviation sector in addition to using LinkedIn? So I think that I will pose this question to three of you. So what exactly are your tips, advices for our students to network? I'll start with Sarah. Thank you, Crystal. This is a great question. Um, what you want to start doing is be seen in different aviation groups, which is why LinkedIn is a great tool, because if your name becomes familiar, people will start to recognize you. If in your location there are actual in-person events taking place, whether that's a, an event at the airport or a group that's getting to get together regularly, then I encourage you to join that event. There's many webinars taking place, so if there is such as this one, join that webinar and ask questions like you're doing now. 
in a lot of webinars, there's also an interactive chat panel so you can communicate with the other participants or you can at least see the names of who's there. And then what that allows you to do is use LinkedIn to look them up and see if they have an interesting profile. Maybe there's a mutual connection. You can ask for an introduction and then finding that connection. So really taking the time to research what's going on in your local area and then using LinkedIn, looking at um, from the business aviation side of things, uh, eBase for those in Europe, the European Business Aviation Convention and Exhibition, ABase in Asia, and NBAA, the National Business Aviation Association in the US. There's a lot of resources there. There's a lot of active groups. Then they have regional chapters and events that you can go to. Asian Sky Group, there's a lot of reports. And so you can start to understand what companies are out there. And then you can see what those companies are doing and join the activities. Thank you, Sarah. So, uh, John. One thing that I would like to suggest, uh, and students, please don't groan, make friends with your professors. I still have uh, friends of mine who are professors now, and I wasn't the A grade student that everybody uh, dreams about being. So um, even if your your marks are, are what mine used to look like, make friends with your professors, get to know them. Um, they've been very helpful to me. Um, they are good friends now and it is a, a real resource and often there's a there's a break between students and professors but um do do get them uh on board and the other suggestion i've already made it take up a hobby that's aviation related because you'll find a lot of interested people hobby wise and it's one of the ways of meeting people face to face you can go to conferences and this kind of thing but um they're either online or they're very expensive and um you, you want also a way of making friends with people face to face. Thank you. Thank you, John. And to Jim? Yeah, look, I'd share the same views as, as the two um, uh, other participants. Um, I don't, don't do much on social media, but I am a big fan of LinkedIn and I, that's the only platform that I um, I use. Um, when As things start to return, and certainly when I reflect back to people that I've made um, long, uh, long time connections with. I think absolutely your, your lecturers and, and uh, university heads are, are, are important, but also when, when events come back to um, re return, uh, think about volunteering at some of these aviation events because you get exposure to, to lots of different people. And probably the last comment that I would make is whether, um, you know, uh, it's any one of us uh, th that's around whether it's your university lecturers, we're all human. So I think um, don't be shy to, to approach and ask questions uh, and, and engage. I, I think that's really important and, and can kickstart many opportunities. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. So I think given the time available for us, uh, I have to uh, wrap up and uh, conclude the session. So uh, I'd like to take the opportunity um, to uh, thank all the speakers joining us today from different geographical locations. And due to the time difference, you have made significant efforts uh, to join us to share your experience with our attendees. And of course, my thanks go to the uh, attendees uh, who have been very uh, patient and there is very uh, really interesting and challenging questions for our uh, uh, speakers to share their experience. So well done. Thank you. And of course, uh, the huge thanks go to the RMIT Europe team. Uh, you have made significant efforts to pull together a fantastic panel speakers and get make all the preparation to make today's event happen. So it's just so timely given that we are talking about the reopening of the international travel uh, lift of the uh, travel bans across the board Orders, either it is interstate or internationally. So we are really uh, very excited to welcome the resume uh, resumption of the international and the domestic travel. So I think this is uh, just a, such a timely event and I thank you very much. Uh, finally, I just want you to uh, stay here for a minute because uh, we would like to hear your feedback so that we can uh, learn what you have learned and uh, what is your, uh, uh, your benefits if you want to share with us and if there are any suggestions that you would like to share with us so that we can improve and also we can organize future future events which will benefit your career development. Thank you very much and we will share the, uh, the link with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time everybody. Thank you. Thank you.